quite a few people on and we are recording. So starting on the covenant and uh, instead of going through each covenant tonight, I wanted to talk about the significance of covenant, what that word means and why it's important for us to understand that word covenant because covenant is powerful. I mean, it's truly a powerful thing. And when we get into the two covenants that we see in scripture, there are two. There's one that's called a uh, promissory or, you know, that covenants are built off promises. And then there's another one that's built off of the works of God or a covenant um, that is done through, um, I can't remember the exact term, but it's, it's uh, basically an action that takes place that does it. But both covenants are not dismissed because, because even with the promised covenant that God gives even to Abraham, there's some action that's taking place in that process, and there's some give and take that's going on here, mostly giving from God to Abraham and the promises of God. But what's powerful is this term covenant, and when we get to the blood covenant, to understand this blood covenant or blood letting is how they used to say it in the old days, but this blood covenant is powerful, and to understand that. So we want to spend a little bit about that and talk about blood covenant, what does covenant mean? And I'm going to give some examples of covenants that took place that they have found and discovered all, excuse me, all over the world. So we definitely want to look at that and and really uh, engage in that because it's it's uh, it's powerful because it's going to give us a more firm and a more sure foundation of our covenant that we have in Messiah. So this is really really important that we capture covenant really well. And then as we build on it, we're going to take a look at two covenants tonight. We're going to take one. We're going to look at one that you can't quite see this term covenant in there, but you see a covenant taking place. And then the next one is the Noah covenant or the Noah covenant. So there's a covenant that takes place before Noah's covenant. And we want to look at that. Okay. So anyhow, uh, the term covenant in Hebrew is the word berit. Everybody say berit. Okay. It, it comes from the root meaning to cut, to cut. So there's blood that's involved with this, even with this term covenant, okay? Now, a, probably a horrible translation, not a horrible translation, but over the years it took on this term testament. And I think that that's a horrible rendition of the word covenant. So we have this concept, the New Testament, okay, which derives from this word New Covenant found in Jeremiah. So we have today the New Testament and the Old Testament. And when we hear those things, that automatically throws in this thing, old equals bad, new equals good, this New Testament, this New Covenant um, is all that matters, and this old one doesn't matter, okay? In some aspects, I would... I would slightly agree with that, okay? But it's not a throw the baby out with the bat, bathwater type of thing, okay? So I, don't, I want us to get rid of that word testament and understand that this word covenant is deeper than this word testament. A testament is something where witnesses look at something, they sign it, they agree to it, it becomes like a contract or it becomes an agreement. And those are all words that can be used for this word covenant, but they don't compare they just simply don't compare, okay? And this is why we say that we, when we go into a, a marital uh, bond with our spouse, we don't get into a marital contract. We don't get in, we don't call it a marital contract. We don't call it a mar, mar, uh, marital testament or an agreement. Even though the world, and, and even though I've experienced it where there's a breaking of that, that marriage contract, what we're really going into is a covenant with one another, a true covenant. And, and so that's, and even the marriage covenant isn't as deep as the blood covenant that God establishes in the Tanakh. And when he establishes the blood covenant, it is so powerful because it's based on him and his promises and his word. So it's a pretty powerful concept when we can get a hold of that because the blood covenant is powerful, powerful. And when you, when you realize that a covenant cannot be broken. When God does a blood covenant and it cannot be broken, that means that you have a sure foundation of, of the promises of God. And then you can stand on those sure foundations. Now, we can walk away from that covenant 
but the scriptures talk about cursing and blessing, right? And so we see those things take place, especially on Mount Sinai. When we start looking at the covenant that was given at Mount Sinai, he goes, there, here are your blessings and cursings, and he gives it to them, which is laid out in almost every contract or covenant that is done throughout the entire world, is that there's things that are laid out. And um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an, um, a contract in, in South America uh, a covenant in South. Now, before I get to the examples, so anyhow, there's a cutting, or there's a blood that's let out. Um, I, I'm part Native American growing up in Wyoming. Uh, it was interesting. I had a cousin and a best friend that we did, actually did a blood covenant, but we were just kids. We didn't know what we were doing, but we, you know, we did the typical, you know, you cut your hand, you know, we cut our hands and we put our hands together and we, we swear to be be blood brothers and 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 to protect one another in school and to hold on to each other for us for life. I'm still my best friend to this day is still my friend that I made that blood covenant with. Okay. It's it's a bond. And so covenant is connected with this word in Hebrew called a sar. A sar for those of you that took my um it's A S A R. For those of you that took my my class on the Jewish idioms of the New Testament, this word asar means to, to bind. So with every covenant, there's a binding effect with this with the covenant. They're, they go hand in hand. So you have the uh, asar and, and you have this uh, barit. You have these two words that kind of go hand in hand. One means to be bound to one another, and the other means to be cut or to cut. So there's a cutting that takes place, and there's a being bound to one another. Okay, so... This is, those are connected hand in hand. So if you're taking notes, it's, it's berit means, to, uh, it comes from the root word to cut, but it also comes from the word bara, which we have the word not only to create, but the word choice. Okay, it's the, the bet, the resh, and the hay. It means the choice. So you take the choicest meat or the choicest delicacy and it's cut on behalf of one another. So you have these, these terms, asar, berit, and the and the roots of of, of bet flesh and hay, uh, which means the choice or the the choices uh, like the choices of meat type of thing. So you see this connection with all of them, um, and but we understand it's a cutting. So that's really important to get that process down. Okay. So they can they have found ancient uh, covenants throughout the entire world. I mean, everywhere you go in every culture. They have found documented ancient uh, uh, rituals or what we call rites that they did. And a lot of times it was established to protect one another and to protect each other's clans or protect each other's uh, uh, tribes with one another. And they would do some. But in all these cultures, except for some of the Semitic cultures, which where, where it came from, is they recognized that their, their aspect of covenant was brought from, from the Near East. It came from the east. It came from the in the ancient days they used to call that the Orient. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Orient how we would call it today would be China and that kind of stuff. But the Orient was to the east. So the Near East is kind of where covenants came from, which is interesting because we know that they they uh, they were brought out. Of, they came out of the scripture, right? And it was an aspect of God. But in almost many many cultures, especially in Africa, uh, missionaries would go to Africa and stuff, and they'd have to form a covenant with tribes to survive. And every culture they went to, covenants included a couple of things. Number one, there was a breaking of blood that took place, but there was a drinking of blood. So they would, uh, for instance, in one tribe, they would cut, like on the forearm, they would use a quill of a turkey or a quill of a chicken or whatever quill that they could get, not a chicken, but of a turkey, and they would actually suck the blood and they would do that to one another. They'd actually suck the blood. They, they'd be bound. So now at this point, they're bound to one another because they would look at blood. And we know in Deuteronomy, it talks about life in the blood, right? And we'll look at that passage. So they would consume one another's blood. And then in that process of doing that, they expected for them to be so bound to one another through that blood that it was greater and stronger than any other thing that, that they can see in their culture. And then when they did that, they exchanged goods so there was always a a verbal type contract they would exchange goods um we know in some some things when you read uh, some cultures when you read about their covenant they would actually 
take a, a parchment paper, write out the terms of the covenant on each, and they make a double. So they didn't have a copy machine like we do. But they would make out two things, and they'd write them out. They would bleed. They would actually take a knife and cut themselves. And with the knife, they would put their like their sign on the on the paper. The other person would cut themselves with another one, put their sign on the paper, and then they would roll up those two papers into a, a, a like a square. And then put it in what they called a house of the amulet of, or the house of the covenant. So they put it in a little box and they'd string it and they'd wear it around their neck. That's really interesting when you think about what's going on here. Is that so so one of them would wear it as a witness and they would exchange it back and forth, but they would sew it into a leather little case, a little token case, and they'd carry it on their bodies or on around their neck or around their arms. And to show that they are in covenant with one another. And you'll see these different covenants throughout all these cultures. But most cultures have this aspect of drinking the blood. In one, in one culture in Africa, in one tribe, they would take beer. And this missionary, uh, and we're looking at the 1700s, 1800s, especially the mid to 1800s, as he was, he was a doctor. He was a missionary, and he'd go out. Livingston. Have anybody ever heard of Dr. Livingston, who was a missionary to a lot of tribes and traveled all over the place? He, he describes a lot of the covenants that he saw taking place in Africa. And one of them was you take beer and then you cut yourself and you put your blood in that beer. And, and they would put their blood in that beer. And then each would consume, the, uh, just take a drink of that beer. And then everybody in each other's parties would continue to, to drink up the rest of that beer, saying that this covenant not only goes between us, but it's between our household, it's between our families, it's between our tribe. And uh, there was many times, uh, hold on one, one second, Barry. There was many times when uh, they were actually starving and had to make, they made a covenant with a cannibalistic tribe and survived <laughs> and were fed and revived because they made a covenant. Uh, if they had not made a covenant, that tribe would have most likely consumed them. And uh, because they were a cannibalistic tribe. So, so covenants were really powerful in the ancient days up until this point. I mean, they're still practiced to this day, especially in some areas of the world. And they're real, still really, really held on to. But it's pretty powerful, this term, how covenants had got through every culture in the world. Barry, you wanted to add something or say something? I just want to say the difference I, between covenants, one is like the promissory covenant, like you were saying was between uh, the creator and us, sort of like a master and servant relationship versus like a husband and wife, which is more of like an obligatory because uh, they're equal parties, which is terms like everyone's an equal, on an equal footing and you're creating a promise with each other. Right, right. That's, a, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Barry. I appreciate it. So those two covenants really fall into that category, those two categories, especially the biblical covenants. You'll find covenants throughout the world that'll have all kinds of different kinds of styles, but all of them are connected to the blood covenant because they all understood that in the blood there was life. See, even to the point in Egypt where they would make a covenant, even, I mean, they would actually take a bone of, what, of a person that they thought was a god, and with the bones, they would break it up and powder it and try to, try to form with that because they believed that there was still life of that soul and that whatever it was, even in the bones, and try to consume that and take on that persona of Ra, the sun god, and those kinds of things. So they would do these kinds of things. So covenants were really powerful in the ancient days. And if you get a look at it, so they, they, there was three things, really more than that, but three main things. There was a an agreement, like a, 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 a some kind of there was a ceremony, but in that ceremony, and people were witnesses, um, they would have conditions. Okay, so there you see conditions of covenant. The second thing that you see, again, is the cutting of blood and drinking. So most cultures drank the blood, and it wasn't like they consumed a gallon of it or a big old huge cup, you know, or something like that. It was just, it was a, a even they would even cut each other's blood and suck from the, from the fingers or do whatever. There was a, this this connection of this drinking of blood type of thing, okay? And then the next one was they would receive an amulet or a ring or some kind of some kind of uh, something that signified 
uh, this covenant, okay? And we can see that in our rings today, okay? This ring holds a covenant, or not this ring, I'm sorry, this ring. <laughs> this ring was a promissory ring. If I graduate my doctoral degree, I'd get my ring, okay? That, I made a promise to myself, I bought me a ring, okay? But, and I did, okay? But this one here is, is Linda and my ring, and she's got one. And this is a sign of our covenant to one another. Now, obviously, we didn't cut, it, cut each other's arms and blood and, you know, you know, and do all kinds of stuff like that. But the concept behind this is we understand that this is not just a contract. This is not just an agreement that we can break or we can get a bunch of lawyers and do that. And even though today divorce is broken and it, divorce has been permitted since the time of Moses, and, and we know those kinds of things have happened, uh, and divorce sometimes is inevitable. I mean, some, all it takes is one person to get divorced in today's culture, um, even though it took two people to get married. But we look at our marriage as a covenant. And I think every person who is a believer that has been married, you go into your marriage not thinking about, okay, well, you know, we'll, let's get married for five years. <laughs> and then nobody goes into marriage thinking that way. And if they did, I'm sorry, but you're not going to make it. <laughs> we go into a marriage saying for better or for worse, you know, for good and for bad, for until death do us part, it's a covenant. And that covenant is powerful because it's also consummated with the husband and wife when they come together. And, you know, if a woman during the, in the ancient days, when if a woman was a virgin and they got married and there was, you know, sometimes the, the uh, what do you call it? The uh, sheets were given to the father of, of the, the groom. They were given to the father of the groom and the father of the bride because they, they wanted to make sure that their covenant was consumed or their marriage contract was consumed uh, properly or consummated properly because she was, she was a virgin and he was a virgin. So you hope that they came together and there was that. So you, you see covenants really are pretty powerful. So the ancient rites between them um, would happen between same religions, people of the same religions, uh, people of different religions right? And different cultures, right? So covenants are pretty powerful in that. Um, and, and so here's what it was. Here's what I like about it. Um, there's a, a definition of it on one that says it was the chosen compact of loving friends of those who are drawn to it only by mutual love and trust. So there's this chosen compact of coming together in a covenant of mutual love and trust that takes place. Okay. Now covenants, now you guys have heard this term uh, blood is thicker than water. Okay. And in the Arab culture, in, among the Arabs, blood was not just thicker than water, but blood was thicker than milk. And not only that, it was thicker than mother's milk. So you get this connection between a baby and a mother suck, sucking the breast and, and feeding from the mother that milk, that closeness, that bond that word asar that we're talking about, when you made a covenant in the ancient Near Eastern world, blood was not just thicker than water. Like we would say here, it was thicker than mother's milk. So that's pretty powerful when you think about that. Okay. And then in some cultures, especially in the, in, in African cultures, um, and I think also in the Arab culture, when you made a covenant with another tribe, it was closer than a brother and a sister, and that if you were to marry within tribes, it was considered incest because it was so close, so powerful. Think about that for a minute. And and it was even closer than twins, a boy or a female, that would suckle their mother's breast at the same time, and they're sharing the mother's milk at that same time. A covenant was even meant to be even greater than that aspect to the point where, again, it was considered incest if you married into that tribe that you made a covenant with. Pretty powerful stuff that is, I mean, it's amazing how it just has, has gone and has made this huge, huge thing, okay? So I, I wrote some things down here, and I want to I want to say I probably already read it, but I, I just want to double it here. He who enters uh, or into a covenant counts himself the possessor of a double, double life, because his friend or his brother is now ready to lay down his life and vice versa. So when you go into a covenant with a with a brother or you go into a covenant with somebody, it's like it becomes a double life at this point. You live two lives because now 
you are called to protect and lay down your life for the person you went into covenant with, and they are called to lay down and put their life, you know, at your covenant. That's pretty cool, isn't it? These are concepts that the ancient world had in their mind. Okay, and then uh, in Arabic, like I said, they called it the Beit Hajib or Hijab. The Beit Hajab, which means the house of the amulet or the amulet. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. The Arabic word, now here's what's really cool. The word alaka, I wrote this down, so this is really cool. It's called alaka. That's an Arabic word. And if that's the same word for friendship, affection, blood, leech, or bloodsucker. And they all come from this root word alaka. So this word covenant in Arabic, okay, comes from the word alaka, which means all of those things, friendship, affection, uh, blood, leech, or blood sucker. Now, the blood sucker doesn't mean in a bad way. <laughs> it's meant to be in a good way, okay? So it's done that. And it, it also, this word, okay, also means to love. So that's what's really cool is you see in this covenant, is when you when you go into covenant with someone with someone it is also meant to love to go into that deep thing too. Okay, so it's kind of cool, and it also means to adhere and to feed. So think about these terms here. To the Middle Eastern world, the Middle Eastern world, they just didn't go into covenant and make a contract and and give money and it's good to go like with a car an auto transaction. You walk out and you never get to see that guy again. This was taking on a double life this was taking on another uh, aspect of, of of a culture that was pretty powerful that transcended so many things okay so um so let's see let's go to uh i want to show you one story we'll go to the source we'll go to first samuel chapter 18 Samuel chapter 18. Okay, we read a story of David and Jonathan. Unfortunately, this story has been perverted. The story has been um, used to say that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship among homosexuals uh, or the gay community. It's been used, uh, it's, not, it's funny, if you are not Jewish, and this isn't to come against any Jews, but if you're not Jewish, I would encourage you, and even if you are Jewish and you weren't raised Jewish, or you weren't raised understanding the scriptures, it's important to always read the scriptures from what they understood, from what the people of the Bible would have understood. And that, that means you have to get into a Jewish mindset especially even when we read the New Testament, we have to put ourselves in, into the ears of the hearers of those days and some of the language of those days. We know that language changes. Like, like it's, any language that's living will change. Any language that is growing will change. As you continue to grow and grow and grow with it, it becomes something totally different. The word conservative is starting to mean something totally different than what it meant just 50 years ago. Uh, the word liberal, the word... Uh, uh, gay. We know those words have all changed over time because they take on different meanings as they grow. When people read the Bible from a modern day perspective, they never get to the true meaning of what's going on here. But if you don't understand idioms, you don't understand the culture, you don't you don't try to get to how they would have understood it in those days, it can lead to some dangerous doctrine. So when we read this, this is where we'll see some of these perverted ideas of covenants and close relationships and stuff. But you go to um, 1 Samuel chapter 18. We get here to verse 1, and it says, Now it came to pass when David had finished speaking to Saul, Jonathan's soul was knit to David's soul, and Jonathan then loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan cut a covenant with David. So we see here, there's a connection of trust, mutual trust and love. You see here that David was in battle um, and Jonathan was in battle. And somehow there was a connection of these two men. And when it came together, there was this close knitting that took place from them. And we could call it a deep, deep friendship today. Like my friends, I have a couple of friends today that um, I have a friend that actually told me one time. 
Okay, I'm saying this and it's being recorded, but I hope it doesn't get put on the, uh, on the, it does get put on the world, I guess, for the world to see, but hopefully I won't make the NBA, uh, nightly news. Um, he told me, he said to me one time, he goes, you ever need to get rid of a body I'll ever, I'll help you. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, why would you tell me that? <laughs> I'm not planning on getting rid of anybody. But, you know, it's like, it's one of those things, it's like, you know, hey, uh, I have such a connection with you and I have such a trust with you. If you ever need my help for anything, I am there. And and so you see this kind of connection between Jonathan and David. And they were really close. And look what it says here. Then Jonathan cut a covenant. So you see this word, he, he, he karat berit. You see this where it's a cutting of the covenant that takes place with David. Because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped off the robe that it was on him and he gave it to David, along with his armor, his sword, his bow, and belt. So you see an exchange that takes place. Okay? So we see that there. So when we flip over to Second Samuel, go to Second Samuel chapter one. Second Samuel, so flip over just to the next book. Second Samuel, and we get to chapter one. Towards the end of it, I believe. Uh, but let me get to it. Uh, let's see. Go to, um, let's look at verse 19. We'll just read from 19 on, uh, or actually verse 17. Then David chanted this lament over Saul and his son Jonathan. Jonathan had, had got killed as well in order that the sons of Judah be taught the song of the bow. So we see here the song of the bow. Why do you think it would be called the song of the bow? Because we see in, in 1 Samuel here where Jonathan gives his bow to David. Okay, And he goes, Behold, it is written in the book of Yashar, Yashar um, Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in Ashkelon Street. Let Philistine, uh, Philistine daughters rejoice lest daughters of the uncircumcised glow. Hills of Gilboa, let no dew or rain be on you, nor on bountiful fields, for there the shield of the mighty one lay defiled. Saul's shield will no longer be anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, Jonathan's bow never turned back. Saul's sword never returned empty. Saul and Jonathan loved and delightful, partner neither in life nor death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. You get here, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, you clothe, who clothed you in scarlet and fine, in finery, who put ornaments of gold on your clothes. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan, on your heights is slain. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasing were you to me. Wonderful was your love to me. More than the love of women. How the mighty have fallen in the weapons of so this has been taken out of context, like I told you about, pervert, perverted to mean something that it doesn't mean. What he's done here is he's basically saying our blood was stronger than our mother's milk. What he's saying is that our blood was stronger than milk, that there was a bond between Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David, that was so powerful, so so great, that he had to be, they were so connected. Because I'll tell you, when you've been, you know, it's like it's it's amazing. I've been I've been part of a team for a long time, for years and years, being on basketball, being in football, playing you know playing all kinds of sports in my life. When you when you bust your hind end and you work hard and you come together as a as a group of people and you you put every ounce that you have into something and you win a championship, it's like there's a closeness and there's a connection that is so amazing that you built a friendship and love towards one another and complete trust with one another. And that isn't even close to what is going on here. These guys were in battle together. They, they, they ran away from, from um, uh, I mean, Jonathan protected David when David was running from Jonathan's dad. You have this love and this mutual bond that took place with these men that were in battle together. I'll tell you, still to this day, Guys who serve in the military with other guys, there's a greater love between them than their spouses, which is really amazing, okay? And so you see this take place. Barry, you had your hand raised up again? Yes, just what, what you were saying, that when you 
they were in battle together. And when you are in battle, you're putting your life in the hands of another person. That person's putting their life in your hands. That creates a certain type of bond that is greater than almost as, as David would say, any love of a woman, because your life is in their hands. Their life is in your hands. Exactly what you were going to. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 it's, it's hard to explain until you've been in a situation like that. I grew up, where I grew up, it was a very bad neighborhood when I grew up. And it's funny because Rollins is not a very big town, but Rollins was a coal mining place when I was growing up. And it was a very, uh, all you had was coal mines and bars. And it was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of se segregation in our community where I grew up. I lived on the south side of the tracks. And uh, on the south side of the tracks were the blacks and the Hispanics. And on the north end of the tracks were the white people, and we would have boxing at the, the common area on the north side of town, and we'd have to walk home. And I remember after boxing practice, we'd walk home and have to go under a, a railroad track, and we went under, there was a tunnel that went under the railroad track. And when we came out on the other side, it was almost like it was constant where, where we'd run into black people and we'd be fighting, or Hispanics and blacks would be fighting. We'd go across the other side of the tunnel, to get in fights with white people. So you almost had to be a part of a gang to just survive. Going to school, you had to belong to um, a group of people, a, a gang, just to survive. Because if one person started fighting or picking on you or hitting you, you had your brother in arms, basically, so to speak, that was there to protect you. And that actually was a deterrent from getting into fights. The fact that we had a whole group of us that said we would you know, we're, we're going to hang out together and we're going to protect one another, kept other people from, from picking on us, and that was a deterrent. And then because they were a gang, that kept them in a deterrent. I don't know if some of you guys have grown up in that kind of a situation or grew up in that kind of a uh, culture. It just doesn't happen in big cities when you hear about the fact, well, I grew up in the hood or I grew up in the gang. Listen, I'm telling you, it happens in small cities too. I had to actually move to Portland, Oregon, which is a big city, to get away from all the fighting that I grew up with as a kid. I got scars across my arm here from from getting um, this one right here. I got a board. I mean, I don't know if you could see it. It's kind of faded away, but I had a board come across me with a nail that somebody swung at me, and the and the nail cut my arm right here with a board, and I still have a scar. I don't know if you can see it, Linda, but it's it's right here somewhere. It's somewhere on in one of these arms, but I don't remember. But I had a I had a scar that came across here just to survive as a young kid. So so when you look at Jonathan and David. And you see this closeness of relationship and friendship that they had that went deeper than a woman's love. This isn't talking about homosexuality. This is talking about the deepest sense of, of a connection between men that we see today. If you've ever talked to anybody who's been to war, and I have. I mean, I've talked to guys who have been to Afghanistan. One of my very good friends, he was a medic. Uh, he was on three or four tours. He's still active in the military. And he was on three or four tours, and he was a medic. He'd go in after the battles and the fights and some of the, the camaraderie between these guys and stuff. They're so close to one another. And it's like you it's hard for us to understand the closeness that they have unless we've been to battle with them. Um, this is just a minute understanding of this term covenant that we see throughout the scripture. And it's not a light thing. And when so when people talk about the New Testament or the New Covenant throws away the old covenant, they don't really have a true understanding or the basis of the, the, I mean, like they really don't get what a covenant is based off of. Because if you understand what a covenant is based off of, it cannot be broken. And that's the thing about it. So the blood covenant that God has with us cannot be broken. It cannot. And he will not break his covenant. with us. That's what's powerful. So it's so strong that you can't break that covenant. Any questions right now, guys, before I go to a bigger screen, now that I can see everybody here? If you raise your hand, I can see everybody. Are any questions or you want to add anything? Linda? She's kind of so wow. I, I, I have a question, please. Okay. So the love of uh, Jonathan and David, it was um, because they made um, that government they connected, they connected, first of all, on the battlefield. If you look at 1 Samuel, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 18, and you look at the, the fights of David and Jonathan in battle, 
Okay, you'll see that there you don't really see a connection going on there, but because they were in battle together, there was they must have one of them must have saved the other, one of them must have uh, there must have been a closeness to it. Uh, Jonathan got to know David because David would minister to his father, right? We know those kinds of things, and because he was the king's son, so he had kind of special favor with David, and David had special favor with him. And it says that Saul brought David in like his own son, so they kind of grew up in a way together. But they also went to battle together, and I think that they just, they just, they just like they just really connected in a way that we don't know. But they take it one step further. And they said, let's make a covenant. And Jonathan, let's make a covenant. And so it says that he cut a covenant with David. So their concept of covenant in those days would have been, and we're going to get to that. We may not get to it tonight, but we're going to get to what they would have done. So even though it says here that they cut a covenant, we don't really read much into that. Like what did, what was the covenant? What did it look like? But I guarantee you it was a splitting of an animal in half, most likely a goat, a lamb, or a, or a calf right down the middle. Right, and then they would have poured it. They would have. They would have. They would put them in halves, and they both would have walked around that covenant together. And we'll talk more about that. They would have both walked around it and did that, and they would have connected through that that blood, that cutting of that covenant. They would. Have, and you see here where Jonathan gave David, I mean his bow, um, gave him all this stuff. His robe, he stripped down and gave him his his stuff. Basically saying, all that belongs to me is yours. It's it's as much yours as it is mine, and I give it all to you. And then and then David even was given uh, uh, Nicole, uh, his, uh, Jonathan's sister, was given to David by Saul. So you you see this powerful thing. So yeah, Alex, they made a covenant, but their friendship was, I mean, it was solidified by that covenant, but it was brought about by their undying love for one another on the battlefield and that's where they really connected they really connected in their undying love for one another it's pretty powerful uh yes Do you think because um david was anointed that jonathan's love for david was something special from the lord that he recognized in david and that's why they he felt so they felt so deeply towards each other I think that plays a part, a role in it. I would think that that's a thing, but I still think that it goes deeper than just the recognizing of an anointing or anointing in something. Well, he felt in his heart, right? Right, he felt in his heart, but again, on the battlefield is where it's solidified. And oh. I think that's where something that when, when um, you know, it's, it's like, it's like I know that every time, the more and more Linda and I get to know each other, the deeper our relationship goes. Right. And the deeper um, and and we didn't start off on the battlefield. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> start on the battlefield, but the, but the thing is, is that uh, we are growing on that battlefield. There's nothing I wouldn't do for her, and I know that she would lay her life down for mm -hmm. me. And it, I know that without a shadow of doubt, because she takes this ring very seriously. She takes our covenant with God very seriously. There's nothing that she wouldn't do to lay her down life for me, and I and I would do the same for her um, because she. That's so wonderful. And I have everybody who meets her tells me how lucky I am. And, uh, and I say, well, actually, I'm more than lucky. I'm blessed. And I'll tell you why I'm blessed is because she's more than I deserve. And so God gave me um, I told her, I'm, I'm the man of her dreams. So I, I mean, you know, I'm just, I was exactly. <laughs> but uh, I'm just joking with that. But um, but their their love for one another, I think there's, I, I think that's a good angle that you brought up. I think that's really kind of interesting is that Jonathan saw him being the anointed one, um, you know, or in that favor. And not, who knows when he would have recognized that because when Jonathan was, or when David was anointed, it was kind of a private thing. Before Linda, though, Barry, you had your hand up again. You want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to know, does it say where, what the uh, parameters of their covenant were? Like in a marriage, you have a ketubah and it's saying, well, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. You know, like that promissory type of covenant between two people. What was it with Jet, Jonathan and David? Does it say or it doesn't say? I don't know. Right. They would. There would have been something like that. Though I would agree with you. I think there would have been definitely a, uh, a covenant written in blood on a ketubah style type thing. For those of you who don't know, a ketubah is a is a, is a is like a wedding agreement or a contract between two parties. 
that is filled and that ketubah is even more than an agreement. That ketubah is the is the conditions of the covenant of the marriage contract or the marriage covenant that you're going to have. So ketubah is really, really important. We have one in our room um, uh, when we got when we got uh, uh, married um, and betrothed. Yeah, and, and Jarrett and uh, Jarrett and uh, Lori got one as well. So so there's there there definitely would have been something like that. But they would have also given each other, like in the ancient Near East, they would give each other sandals as well. They would give each other a sandal, and and they would say, if anything happens to you or happens to me, let this sandal be a smack among your face. So there's a lot of things that, but they definitely would have said something, and there would have been a witness there. So yeah, uh, Linda, you had. Your but it, but it's not in scripture anyway. It doesn't say in in scripture what it was. So uh, there could be somewhere. It could be in another book recorded somewhere. But we could, you know, I just I didn't look for it, but it. We know that uh, it would have been something, though, because that's how the right. ancient Near East world practiced right. covenant system. So we know that they did something. But we do know we see the cutting of blood. We see a mutual agreement. And we see a giving and sharing of the choices that they had. Uh, you know, could you imagine? They had just got done with a battle. To, to Jonathan, it, his sword meant something to him. His cloak meant something to him. It was, it was what he used to protect himself with. And he gave the best, the choice of what he had on, he gave to, to David. So you see this, this exchanging of the best of the best that a person has. Now, Linda, you want to say something? Yeah, for uh, Lisa, knowing that um, Jonathan eventually knew that David was anointed to be king, and it just shows the power of that love because he preferred David over his own right to the throne. That's how strong their love was. He knew that David was anointed because of his father's, you know, um, because Saul forfeited that because of his sin. And Jonathan totally loved him so much to say, I give up all rights to the throne. Yeah. Imagine that, because Jonathan would have been the first one in line to be on the throne. He gave that all up. That's powerful, very, very powerful. And to love David in that sense of knowing that you're losing out is powerful. I mean, and to make a covenant with him still. I mean, it's amazing. So they took their covenants very serious in these days. Um, that's one thing that we need to understand is that these covenants were not easily broken. And if they were broken, um, and, you know, I mean, woe to the person who broke it. Um, woe to that family. Woe to that entire tribe that would break a covenant that was set with another group of people. It's pretty powerful. Um, anybody else have anything to add or any questions at this point? Yeah, Jared? I just, it, it was either yesterday morning or this morning, I actually had that vision of um, David and Jonathan, you know, before uh, David had to flee and they were weeping on each other, you know, they were hugging each other and weeping together. And um, just through the conversation, understanding that it's e even a little beyond that loving your neighbor as yourself, you know, where you're even self selfless and you're loving someone more, you know, so I just share, want to share that. Yeah. Amen. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Loving yourself more. I mean, loving the person more than yourself. And that's really what marriage boils down to when it comes to a marriage contract is that you, you die to yourself. You just die to yourself in Egypt. They would actually go through um, another form of, of a covenant where they would bury a temporary, they would make a temporary uh, grave and they would lay down in these graves and pour blood, each other's blood on each other as if there's a dying effect that takes place. And then when you come up out of that, you become so connected that death itself cannot take away the covenant between each other. And that's, that's a powerful thing when you think about that. So when you get these concepts of like, okay, where does all these cultures get these ideas of covenant and, and how they practice them, all the rights to covenantal 
uh, uh, bloodletting and all those kinds of things. Of just you know, where did it come from? We know it comes from Scripture. We know it comes from God, and it's important for us to understand that because He had to establish a strength in that. Alex, uh, go ahead. Yes. What is the best argument to share with those people who think that the relationship with Jonathan and David uh, was a homosexual uh, relationship? I think the best argument to have is to talk about the covenant, saying that's not really what was going on between David and Jonathan. This is a story of covenant relationship with him. It's called covenantal relationship. I think if you talk to them about covenantal relationship, what that meant, you go to 1 Samuel chapter 18 here, where you show that Jonathan, uh, through battle, through battle, became so close to David that they made a covenant with one another. They were like brothers out in the, in the military field. And you know what? They can't argue against this because they're just they're trying to take scripture and trying to twist it to make it to mean something that it doesn't. But if you tell them that, that this is a covenant that they were making that draws people closer than a brother or a sister. Draws, it, blood is thicker than milk to the Eastern world. And even more so, blood is thicker than a mother's milk. They love one another more than a woman's love. And it doesn't mean that they were gay. What it means is that they were so bound together and so connected together. There are friends that I have relationships with that we can just look at each other and we can do stuff that my wife would have no clue what we mean. You know, like we could say something, we could do something, or we have a handshake, or we have whatever, that I don't have that kind of a connection with my wife in a way. I have a friend that's, that's uh, I have friends that are deeper to me in my relationship with them and God than my own personal physical family, which I think a lot of us could test to that some of our closest friends in our life are fellow believers in the Messiah, and they're closer to us than our blood relatives. I, I just had a cousin today that I grew up with when I was in Rollins, and I always loved her. She was amazing. She was fun. Um, she was a very shy person. She was a little heavy, and so she got teased a lot. But uh, she was a wonderful person, an older cousin. And I just heard from my cousin today, this morning, he said he was on his way to Rollins because he asked me to pray for her because she was in the hospital. He asked me to pray for her um, earlier. And I said, yes, I'll keep you guys in prayer. And uh, her name is Marcia. And then he he, he uh, sent me a message this morning telling me that Marcia passed away and passed away this morning. Um, she had got an infection. They found her Sunday morning in her home. And uh, I don't know how long she had been passed out or anything like that, but she had, she had got an infection. I don't know what that infection was. I, I don't have details, but it spread throughout her whole body that by the time that she was put in the hospital and ended up passing away today and he had he didn't get to see his sister. But um she was very close to me growing up and I've always loved Marcia. She was an amazing, amazing person. And yet I've seen covenantal relationships with brothers and sisters that are even deeper than that. And um I'll tell you it's hard. But I have I have brothers in the Lord right now that are that are so close to me covenantally that uh, I know they would die for me in an instant and I would die for them. So, uh, and that, that's very, you know, some of my relationships go deeper than my marriages. So, so when the scriptures, when people try to per pervert the scripture and try to say that they were, they were they all have a covenant relationship and honestly, you're, you're taking the Bible out of context and you don't understand the ancient Near Eastern world. You don't really understand how they, they develop relationships and friendships and protections and stuff in those days. So that's probably the best argument you can give. Anyone else before we look at a couple of covenants? Linda, you have yours? Um, you just mentioned about the bond that men have in battle. That might be something that a lot of people have seen in their relatives, too, that they could understand. Yeah, yeah. But you got to get them away from... From this love potion number nine or something, you got to get away from peace, love, joy, flower, power type stuff. It, it, it's not this. This it's not this. They didn't have a, a physical relationship. They had a they had a relationship of of ultimate deep love and respect for one another. 
that was birthed in the battlefield, that they would have died for one another beyond so much, and they connected in such a way that they become brothers. And those brothers become thicker than physical brothers. I mean, they become closer than blood blood brothers, so to speak. They become blood covenant brothers, which is deeper. Um, so that's how we have to look at it. Um, all right, so everybody, any more questions? Okay, jump to Genesis chapter 3. Let's take a look, or Genesis chapter 2. Let's take a look at the covenant that's taking place actually before before we actually see the term covenant, okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, we, we know that God is... God has made Adam and Eve and he puts them in the Garden of Eden. And this is before Eve was, he's, you know, God's done the creating and stuff. We see here, let me, somebody's beeping here. Luke, and I think that's you. Uh, I'm going to mute you. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody here real quick. I'm going to mute you all. So if you have anything to um, add or something like that, just raise your hand. Or if I don't see you, you can unmute and interrupt. Um, but yeah. So try to stay muted because there's some noises that go in the background that can hurt other people's ears. Okay, so we get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says this, Then Adonai Elohim said, It is not good for a man to be alone. Let me make a well-matched helper for him. Adonai Elohim had formed from the ground every animal of the field and every flying creature of the sky. So he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and to all the flying creatures of the sky and to all the animals of the field. But for the man, he did not find a well-matched helper for him. Adonai Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs. A cutting is taking place here. Okay? So he's cutting into man. So you're getting this concept again of, of cutting. Now, very shaken his head like, ah. He's taking from man. And obviously God could just pull a rib out without anything happening. But we know that he had a scar there because of what it says here. It says, says um, and he sewed him back up. So obviously he, he did take, he didn't just create a rib. Okay, so I, I will disagree with Barry on this, on the head shaking. But um, he not only created, he didn't create a rib, he took a rib. And so he took a man and he had to form it out of that. So he says here, a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. So God did become a surgeon on him, I think, in my opinion. In my opinion, he took he took uh, uh, Michael's sword, and Michael was upset about this one, but God did it. He took Michael's sword, and he just sliced open. Okay, anyhow, verse 22. It doesn't say that in there, but it's implied if you look closely. Okay, Adonai, Adonai Elohim built the rib. I love that. I love this translation on this. Built the rib. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Built a rib, which he had taken from the man into a woman. Then he brought her to the man. Then the man said, whoa, 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 whoa. This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh. This one is called woman, for from man was taken this one. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. So you see here a... a Kind of a uh, a barit taking place here, a, a covenant taking place. Again, you don't see the language, you don't see it, but it's kind of like the first time you see this concept of 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 taking from one person and developing another person and cutting open the ribs or the side of man, which would have had blood there. Okay, so you see this outpouring of blood that takes place here. Then he creates a man. He sews up Adam again. So there's this this concept of covenant going here. And so what we see here is this idea, again, why marriage covenant is so strong between a man and a woman and why it's so important and why it's so godly and why it's very important for us to take our covenant with one another seriously because we get reconnected through marriage. We become one flesh again in marriage. This is why we don't rush into marriage. This is why we make sure we pray and choose our mate wisely. This is why we ask God to really give us a helpmate, because when we become one flesh and bonded to one to another, it's like the rib has returned back to the man. So you see um, the idea or the concept of a covenant taking place here that God is making with Adam. And even though most people would not consider this a covenant, 
I would. It's like looking at Adam and he created Adam and he's, and there was not a helper met for him anywhere out of in the entire animal kingdom. And nothing was close that would have compared to, to, to Adam. Adam was not connected to an ape. Adam was not connected to a, a chimpanzee. He was not connected to a orangutan. He was not connected to a deer. He, there was no helpmate found for Adam throughout all the kingdom. So therefore, God had made a promise to him, like, okay, it's not good that man should be alone in this process. And he needs to make a helpmate for him. So you see, almost kind of like, um, you see this uh, promissory, but you also see an obligatorial, like uh, Barry brought up early. You see where God is saying, listen, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm not going to leave you alone. Obviously, when when um, when um, Adam named the animals, there was male and female, and he was noticing that. It's like imagine for a minute, you're in this state, you're the only man that has, you're the only human being, and you're sitting there and you're looking at a male lion and a female lion, and you see how they connect and how they can become one. You see you see how the deer are male and female. You see how the birds of the air, male and female, and you see all these creatures, male and female, and able to connect and be close to one another. So you see this covenant, in my perspective, a covenant that God is making to Adam, saying, I'm going to make you one with someone that I'm going to take from you and build for you a helpmate suitable for you. And Eve was the only one that was not made from something else, right? Eve was made from man. So you see this ultimate connection between male and female here. Uh, he didn't form her like he formed Adam. He formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils, gave him the ruach, the nephesh life. But from that one life, he pulled from Adam the rib and created a woman and, and gave her life. But so woman wasn't created from the dust like Adam was, right? That, which is why we have two different uh, chromosomes and that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Would you like to add to that, Mrs. Creation? She's she loves creation. Uh, Barry has his hand raised. Let's see if Linda has something first here. Well, I first thing that came to my mind is a lot of women will think that they uh, especially like their pets better than they like people. People once they get <laughs> divorced, and because it said that God, um, it's not good for man to be alone. Men especially need to have that help me. And we're made in the image of God, both of us made in the image of God. And us women bring in the beauty of God. We also bring in the love of God. So that is our role as women. Amen. Barry. Um, yeah, I like the idea that uh, woman was fashioned by God rather than just created. You know, man was made from the dust, but woman had to be fashioned, meaning that, uh, and in the Hebrew belief, which is why woman is really elevated even above man in that way, because God fashioned her in a very specific way, uh, rather than man just coming from dust. That That's yeah. one thing. Um, the other is... I wanted to see what, what was the covenant, though, that God did, because it was really Adam that asked the father to create woman. It was really, his, you know, it was almost like a, uh, an answer to Adam's prayer rather than a covenant kind of thing, where I'm not sure what, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to make a woman, you're going to have to do this, you know, uh, which would be the covenant. And I'm not saying it's not, I mean, covenants are, when you do an overview of covenants, you know, you'll get five theologians. They'll give you 10 different answers about how many covenants there even are. Right. Um, the other mm -hmm. thing was that, what does it say? And there wasn't a, a mother and father yet for Adam or Eve. And yet in 24, it says a man will leave his father and mother. Yeah. <laughs> and there was no father or mother for either of them yet. Right. So how did that fit into scripture in, in in the writing part, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think who authored Genesis is writing from a, from a uh, like, for instance, if I was to write about my life earlier, then I could sit there and say, well, and this is why he became a pastor. And, you know, it happened when I was 13 years old, da, 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 you know, so 
Moses who wrote Genesis that we believe Moses wrote Genesis is that it's it's for him he's not only just writing the account of the creation and then breaking it down and if you look at it especially among Jewish thought here's what happens with Jewish thought and I love this this is how Jewish writers write and you'll see this throughout the scriptures they'll give you a whole bunch of stuff and they'll just go pour out this whole thing then they go and then they go back and then now they break it down in sections so you see all that's with creation the creation yeah. story and so you'll see the whole big thing of creation then he goes back this is how man was right. formed and then this is how woman was formed and and then like like you said then all of a sudden moses is writing it and then he's probably going oh and this is why a man shall leave his mother and his father and the two shall become one because the concept of one flesh had grown to that point that when genesis was written that moses could insert that in there that that he could insert that thought in there and still not lose the flavor of what God was trying to say through that whole process. Um, but it, you know, where I come from, it's like I like I like what you said too. It's almost like an asking and a prayer that's coming from Adam. Uh, mm-hmm. saying, wow, you know, Lord, I see all this happening around me. Da da da. But you see this almost like this this relationship between Adam and and God that already started off pretty amazing. Where God says, "Hey, trust me with this. Trust me with this." And again, like I said, this may not even be a covenant. But in my perspective and how I look at it, I see the first point where we see a cutting taking place. And I think it's important that we have to understand. Remember the last couple of, uh, couple of teachings I've done on Wednesday night? It's always important to see that when something first is written about in the scripture, there's some important factors behind that and some important theological conditions to look at during the, sometime, the first time something is mentioned in the Bible. So this is the first time we see a cutting taking place of flesh. And, uh, you, you know, obviously, I mean, it wasn't probably like, you know, he took Adam and laid him on a, on a, a doctor's table and got put on his little light and did, you know, but whatever we see, we see that God actually takes the rib, puts him in such a deep sleep. They gave him anesthesia. Okay. So we know that he, he, in modern terms, we would say, you know, we need Alex on this one. Alex, we need you for this. Uh, Alex has got to administer anesthesia to this, right? So, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, he needed anesthesia. God opens him up, takes a rib, seals it back up. So obviously, there, Adam is going to have a scar. We're going to see a scar on Adam's side when we see him. And even with his new created body, I'm sure it will have something like that possibly. Who knows? It'll be interesting. Um, it doesn't say we won't have scars. It'll just say no more pains and aches. <laughs> Yeshua has scars. Yeshua has scars. So... So it's possible that we will recognize Adam with the scar and we will recognize Eve and uh, it'll be, I mean, we're going to recognize everybody, but um, we see this cutting. And if we get this word barit from, and that Hebrew word again uh, means to cut or to, to uh, and we also see this word asar to be bound. So we see a cleaving taking or a, a pulling out taking place and then coming together, a cleaving a coming back together, but the two cleaved, the, you know, the two side by side become one again, one flesh. You see this reconnecting. You see a covenantal um, barit here. You see this cutting taking place. So that's one that I wanted to show. And then we look here at um, uh, Genesis chapter 3, and then you go down. Um, let's go to 13. Uh, before we move on to this one, is there any questions on that one that I just mentioned? I mean, again, it's just, it's it, to me, it's their hints. And there are allusions to a covenant that's taking place here, even though it's not listed or named. And I would think that if you put, if you bought a book on covenants and the uh, biblical covenants, this one probably won't even be in it. But I believe that you see, you see the start, the idea in the picture, the illusion behind a covenant. So, uh, but it's a, it's a great one. I mean, you pull out the Hebrew, I can pull out Aramaic, I can pull out other languages. Uh, they have uh, pretty amazing stuff on there. So. Anyhow, verse 13, let's go to Genesis chapter 13 here real quick, and we'll look at another one. And again, this is the Noahic covenant, but again, I want you to see here, this is what happens after, after God tells them not to eat from the tree, tree or the fruit of the tree of, of good and evil and the tree of knowledge, right? The two trees in the garden, right? He gets here and they broke that. They, they didn't listen to God on that. So they're not breaking a covenant, but God tells them, don't eat from this tree. And they eat from the tree. They eat the fruit of that tree, right? And we see all this stuff. It says, verse 12, 
or verse 13, Adonai Elohim said to the woman, what did you do? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Verse 14, Adonai Elohim said to the serpent, because you did this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above every animal of the field. On your belly will you go and dust will you eat all the days of your life. I will put animosity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pain from conception to labor. In pain, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be toward your husband. He must rule over you. Um, I try to remind my wife of this, but she just yells at me. She just laughs you now and, and, and jokes, joking. For some husbands and wives, I probably shouldn't joke that way. <laughs> then to the man, he said, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate of the tree, which I commanded you, saying you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. With pain, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will sprout for you. You will eat the plants of the field, but the sweat of your brow will you eat food. Um, by the sweat, I'm sorry, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until so you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. Now Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Adonai Elohim made Adam and his wife tunics of skin, and he clothed them. Then Adonai Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So now, in case he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever, Adonai Elohim sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he expelled the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he had cherubim, uh, cherub, well along uh, with the whirling sword of flame to guard the way of the tree of life. Okay, so in here again, we don't see a covenant, but we see... Again, skins that were made for for both man and female. Animal skins were made, which means, and this is a, a Jewish concept that has gone on for thousands of years, and it's also a Christian concept that animals must have been, an animal had to lay down its life for the skins to be presented to, the, to Adam and Eve. So we see here again another cutting taking place or blood being spilt. Okay, and if we go to Deuteronomy, just flip over to De Deuteronomy chapter 12. Just real quick while you're in here, I just want to show you real fast. If we flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 12, and I believe it's, I believe it's verse 24. So we get to 12, verse 24. Let's actually look a little bit above it. It says, uh, let's look at verse 23. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you are not to eat the life with the meat. You are not to eat it. You are to pour it out on the ground like water. You are not to eat it so that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in Adonai's eyes. So God is connecting this concept of blood to saying that there's life in the blood. Don't eat the blood. Okay? And you get this connection with that Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 24, what we just read about Adam and Eve here in Genesis chapter 3, where we see tunics were made for them out of this out of animal skin. And so you have this concept again that blood is being poured out, okay? Blood is being poured out, and there's a covenant that was broken because we see the cursing that was taking place here. So when God asked them not to eat from it, it was a, it was a very serious thing that he was doing. He's given he gives us the choice, right? Because we are uh, he created us in his image, which means we have free we have free will. And we can choose to love him or choose not to love him. We can choose to obey him or not choose to obey him. But our choices have consequences. And and unfortunately an animal had to pay for the consequences of the fall of man in, in Genesis. So we see here um, uh, these two hints or allusions to covenant to a covenant, and I wanted to br bring those out today and talk about those before we look at any other covenant, because it's important for us to have a, a foundation, a foundational understanding of of how important a covenant was in the ancient Near Eastern world, how important it was for for the blood to be poured out in this instance, how important it was to have conditions to a covenant. And then also for an amulet or a, a symbol of that covenant. 
So here we see we see a symbol, not only the conditions here, but we see a symbol of tunic. So even in our, our clothes today, even though we don't wear animal skin as much anymore today, we do on our on our shoes, um, but we don't wear animal furs or anything up here anymore. We don't we don't carry that with us. It's it's a reminder of our choices and our sin that life had to be spent um, because we broke our word or we broke we were disobedient to God. So I just wanted to bring that out as the basis of a covenant before we go deeper into our our, our lessons on, on on the covenant. So let's take some more questions and some answers and additions. Barry has his hand raised, but uh, before he speaks here, we're going to talk a little bit more. Um, not tonight, but I wanted us to come to a conclusion. So if you have any questions, any answers, any additions, I want you to bring it up because we're going to take a look at the Noahic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant next week. Okay, and we're going to look at each one of those, look at the condition of those, talk about those, and then see how we can apply that to a modern-day perspective. Uh, Barry, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, that I saw that as being the first covenant, uh, covenant of creation where God says, I'm going to do this, you're going to have life, you'll have a really good time in the garden, as long as you don't do this. And it was really just the one commandment, don't eat from this, uh, which says a lot of times, uh, even one commandment is sometimes hard for us to follow, even if we're walking with God face to face in the garden, that uh, even though I, it does, it, the commandment was really given to Adam, it doesn't say it was given to Eve, but I'll assume that Adam was supposed to be a leader over Eve and supposed to tell her everything that was going on. I'm just making that leap. It doesn't say. Um, the I other, think I think I, it's a good. So I think it's I think it's a good leap because there is a, a covenant of creation taking place here, and there really right. is a version of that covenant that God made with Adam and right. Eve. The, the right. other, cov I see two covenants in this, though. I also see a covenant of grace. And yeah. that, that even though Adam and Eve sinned, God said, I'm going to clothe you and you're not going to die. But I'm going to give you grace and you'll just have a consequence of this going on. So I see, for me, that's the first sense of God, God's grace being shown yeah. to sinners. Well, and I would add, I would add to that grace the other aspect. He's like, if we don't take away this aspect for them to eat from this tree, they'll live forever. So God's grace kind of said, I, I can't allow them to live forever in this state. And so by His grace, He allowed He allowed us to now have a limited lifetime. And we know that lifespan had got shorter and shorter and shorter after the Garden of Eden. But He took away that option for us to actually live in our sins forever. Um, so that, that is a, another aspect of God's grace. Not only did God's grace cover them, which is great, because, you know, a lot of times the, the, the Old Testament is saying it's, it's a covenant of law, or it's a, it's, a, it's a law, and it's not God's grace. Right. Yeah, you don't God's see, they, they don't want to say grace is in the Old Testament even. Exactly. And I and see so, that's the covenant of grace right there. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, Steve, you have your hand raised? That's, that's, probably, that's probably the first marriage. Because it says that they, they, they were unclothed, they, they, had no, they, they had no shame. But they had, then they would have to be together to create. Yeah. So that, I and think, actually, the couple of the first marriage that would be, wouldn't it be? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic, yeah. And so, I mean, right now we're seeing, not even getting into, like, what some people would signify as the first covenant. We've already seen two aspects of covenants taking place here. And, and also we see a, a definitely, I would say, a covenant of grace. We can definitely call that another aspect, a covenant of grace, because God's stepping in and saying, listen, uh, because he loves us and he, he loves us with an undying love, he's going to do whatever he can. And uh, he stepped in to, to save the day, so to speak. Um, that's really great. Any other? Uh, Lynn? Yeah, as an animal lover, I can see why or I can see how Adam would have um, understood the judgment of God. Because when you name an animal, you take it personally when something happens to that animal. That's like anybody who lives on a farm. You don't ever name the cows or the chickens because it's really hard to eat them at that point. 
And so Adam and Eve, understood, well, especially Adam, understood the consequences of that sin really deeply when that animal had to shed its blood in place of them. And, you know, that's pretty powerful. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, the animal that was slain for him and that Eve were, were sheep, was a sheep. It wouldn't surprise me at all with the with us seeing sheep throughout the Tanakh uh, and the lamb being the lamb of God and everything like that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if the animal that was sacrificed to skin Adam and Eve were, were the sheep. Uh, any more comments, guys? I mean, uh, whatever. Yeah, uh, Alex. Yes, I just want to say that, that I that I see uh, a wonderful parallel between Adam and Eve when God cut, you know, his rib and take, you know, Eve from, from his uh, rib. But also uh, Yeshua, when, when he was cut in his, uh, you know, in his rib, then, then this is exactly uh, what happened with uh, Adam, right? And this right. is exactly what what is the mean of a government but also the result of this uh, grace and love is is the body of the believers right yep yep amen well and you know you you kind of you jumped way ahead but i like how you jumped way ahead the idea behind yeshua i mean imagine this he had been torn his flesh had been torn he had the thrones thorns put on him and pierced into his head and everything but on that cross was a cutting that took place, right? And we yes. see that cutting that talked about. And we know that a covenant is established by that cutting. It, that's part of the breach. That's part of that concept, the right? To, to, to and so you see this new covenant that's spoken about in Jeremiah, uh, chapter 31, now becoming a real reality when Yeshua was on the cross, that he was cutting and he broke his blood. I mean, during the Passover say he goes, now this is my my body broken for you. We don't see his body being broken, but he's speaking that forth. And then we see his body broken, right? This is my blood that has been poured out for many, right? And you see that taking place and you see with the water. There's a lot of other aspects between the water and the blood that came out. There's other connections biblically. But you do see a cutting of a covenant. And mm -hmm. this covenant, that covenant with Yeshua, unlike Every other covenant in the scriptures cannot be broken. That cannot be broken. So we'll get to that. You just jumped the gun on that one, Joel. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any, anybody else want to add it before we close in prayer? All right. Well, Linda, why don't you close this? Sure. Thank you, Lord, for your covenant for us that cannot be broken because you made it on yourself. Thank you, Yeshua, for taking that punishment for us and giving us your blood to bring us into the covenant of love, into your family. Thank you, Lord. You are good, and we thank you for all your goodness to us. Amen. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thank you for tuning in. That was a fun study tonight. I hope you guys are learning some stuff. Um, uh, Again, covenants are practiced throughout the world, all over the world. Um, they still are practiced. They are still really in force. Um, we don't see them as much as in, in America because we do contracts and people break contracts all the time, unfortunately. But we have a covenant with God that cannot be broken. And do, being a believer and partaking of the blood and the body of Yeshua in communion mm -hmm. That. That's where we're going to get eventually and talk about that and talk about that that powerful being a part of who he is in his fullness of that covenant reality by us having that foundational understanding of blood covenant when we take partake of communion it should be a powerful concept for us at this point uh, that we just were blown out of the water. So uh, when we get to that point we'll talk deeper about it. But I just it, we needed this foundation today and I hope you guys are excited. To keep mm -hmm. tuning in to the next one coming up okay god bless you guys uh we have a wonderful thing on shabbat taking place steve is going to read from the, the torah this week and we are going to do a blessing over our, our deacons and our deaconesses and mm -hmm. uh it'll be a wonderful time we're going to do 
We're gonna pour out Aaron's oil. <laughs> We've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.